Latter-day Peace Studies is produced by peace-loving members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Any views expressed herein are not to be taken as official positions of the Church or its authorities. Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. I'm Shiloh Logan. And I'm Ben Peterson. Thank you for joining us as we discuss this week's reading of Come Follow Me, as outlined by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're recording these podcasts from our homes, and so you'll often hear children playing, dogs barking, and babies crying. This is our life, and we love it. Our hope is that as we discuss these scriptures and truths, we will come to a more perfect understanding through experiencing the Atonement of Jesus Christ and find greater peace in our lives. Okay, everybody, uh, we're back. We are doing sections 121, 122, and 123 this week. This is fun because section 121 is probably the section or scripture that we have quoted from the most, maybe save the Beatitudes (laughs) um, in all of our podcasts, right? I think it is. So Yeah. So we've talked about 121 in a lot of podcasts already over the years. And now we're finally actually doing you know, a podcast on section 121. And so I'm hoping that that still means we have something to say about it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So here in, in church history, we've had the whole Missouri stuff go down, right? And um, because of everything that happened, uh, Joseph Smith has been charged with various things and um, arrested. And he ends up in a jail in Liberty, Missouri. Now we call it Liberty Jail, um, which is, you know, obviously like this oxymoron term. Right. <laughs> but I, it's not clear to me whether like that was the n- actual name of the place or whether it was just a jail that was in Liberty. I, I'll have to go look that up and see if, <laughs> see if I can tell <laughs> which was the case. But while he's there, uh, goes through just all kinds of awful, uh, things, you know, uh, he's there with, with several other of his friends and, They are cold. This is through the winter. They don't get much food. Um, There's stories of them being fed awful things. They aren't aren't afforded very many comforts, and uh, it's just not a very good time for them. At the same time, they're they're hearing reports of all the additional awful things that are happening to the saints, them having to flee and and go over to, uh, to Quincy and then ultimately to commerce uh, and Nauvoo. So they're kind of, you know, getting all these reports of the things that are happening. So not a good time for them. Joseph Smith is is feeling uh, abandoned spiritually. He's He writes letters to the saints and, you know, he doesn't have much else to do there, I guess. And they let him write letters and deliver them at least. That's that's something. And in in some of these letters, he pens what now have been canonized as revelations in uh, these sections here 121 through and 122 and 121 is it starts off as basically a prayer it's very poetic from the beginning uh, we've get the first six verses that are joseph's prayer and then the rest of the section is basically the lord's answer but you can see through the lord's answer also how it's being filtered through joseph and all of the um the trauma that he's gone through and the concerns that he has the frustrations the anger you see that all tied up in this answer that he's receiving and you see the lord working on him through this through this prayer you kind of see this struggle going on as he's writing it and so we end up in this section with you know these verses that we quote all the time as sort of the culmination of this this revelation, this understanding of something that Joseph Smith has been trying to put his finger on for years now, and that's this concept of priesthood. He's tried to present it and explain it, symbolize it in all these different ways, and he comes about as close as I think he ever had, ever has, or ever does, in the end of this section to to kind of pointing at what what he really means or what the Lord is trying to have the saints understand by this concept of priesthood. Starting off here in section 121, these first few words that 
I think we could just meditate on these for a while, right? So he says, O oh God, where art thou? And I think if that's not a question that every single human being at some point in their life has asked, then they will in one way or another, whatever this means to them, you know, they may look up at the sky and, and just wonder why is reality against me or why is God against me or, or not listening to me and I think that this, just these few words here really say a ton about the human experience itself. And so for Joseph Smith to kind of start off with that, right? It's, it's this fitting beginning to a conversation, an outpouring, a therapy session, if you will, with God, where he starts to resolve a lot of his traumas and then voices him for the saints as well. You know, moving moving on from there, he starts petitioning the Lord for all of of the the things, the awful things that have happened to the saints in particular, um, and also to himself. And then the the Lord's the first few words of the Lord's response are, I think, just as as fitting, right? He says, "My son, peace be unto thy soul." That's ultimately, you know, what that what that longing is for, you know, trying to, to wonder what is, how am I supposed to resolve all these things in my life? And then for the Lord to, to just offer peace is it's an interesting response because it doesn't really answer any of the particular concerns, right? It doesn't solve any problem that is, that is voiced or cataloged. It's, it really is just something else completely. It leaves all of the concerns and questions behind and just presents peace. Right? As an answer to a question that's not really even asked, almost. I like what you said there about this being like a therapy session. <laughs> because section 121 almost doesn't make sense as, as a text, as a revelatory text unless we're really positing it, putting it into the context of a therapy session. Because when you look at the, you know, Joseph Smith's plea for the first five verses, and then verse seven, you have God's response. And I love that. Peace be unto your, thy soul. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. And then basically from that point, for the next three columns, is this wrathful, vengeful, spiteful God that's going to go after Joseph's enemies. But then all of a sudden it transitions basically almost even on a single verse, almost on verse 33, it transitions. And after it transitions, then it just opens up into this discussion of priesthood and about the rights of the priesthood, about no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by the priesthood, but by persuasion and long suffering and gentleness and meekness and love and everything that we've talked about before, all without compulsory means. What what stands out to me, one of the things that was uh, present there as I was reading through it this time was this realization yet again that when I sit down to read scripture, the way I, you know, I was trained to read scripture at an early age was basically that scriptures tell us exactly what the mind and will of God is. That scripture is objective, universal, metaphysical fact. And what has come to me over the years is to recognize that scripture is not necessarily just absolute metaphysical fact. But it's a story, it's a story of a people and their wrestling with God. It's that relationship that you talked about, Ben, about how many of us have ourselves cried out, where art thou? How many of us, like Christ on the cross, have exclaimed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, this, this is, this is an experience that we all have had. And then to recognize how God came to heal Joseph. And so for me, when I, when I'm reading sections 121 through 123, what became very present for me in this, in, in this, through this reading of it was to recognize what God was doing for Joseph, for Joseph's needs. And then to bring Joseph from, from where his state of mind and his state of being were at 
through the complexity of the emotions that he was feeling. I mean, I, I can't even imagine. For what, you know, we, last week we talked a little bit about some of the things that the saints had done to kind of usher in this whole thing and, and, and their participation in, in the escalation of the, of these efforts. But even then, what happened to them was not just. And so to recognize that you have Joseph Smith who has heard the travesties committed against the saints, who has a family out there that he can't contact, he doesn't know what's going on, he doesn't know if they're safe, he doesn't know what's going on with them through most of this time, he doesn't know if the mobs are coming after them, he's heard stories of of people that he's loved. Now, one thing that we're going to talk about here that I want to bring out is just how loyal Joseph is. That's, that's one of Joseph's modes. You know, we talk a lot about modes. That's definitely one of Joseph's modes. He is a big loyalty guy. And if you stay true to Joseph, he will literally die for you. Kind of a thing. And so we see in like verses 9 through 11, God coming out saying, your friends still stand by you. You are not yet as Job. Almost Joseph having this moment, this internal conversation with himself of realizing his plight cannot be worse than what it is right now, and then realizing that his friends are still there next to him. And we see that again in verse in section 122, where the Lord says, Thy people shall never be turned against thee by the testimony of traitors. So you start to see these very nuanced fears of Joseph that we, we can kind of start to see inside of his own psyche the things that are really troubling him and how God is leading him through this. Because once Joseph is betrayed, you know, there's quite a few evidences that Joseph becomes a little resentful. And when a lot of bad things happen against Joseph, well, you have three columns of God, of God mm-hmm. saying, listen, what do we have to say to be able to have Joseph be okay? And then the minute that happens, the the minute that is made, where Joseph can take down from his mind the animosity of vengefulness and be pacified. He's given it to the Lord. Yeah. It's the handing over. Yeah. And God's like, I'll take care of it. And I don't know how many of these three columns in 121 of God basically coming out and saying, I'm going to curse them that curse you. I'm going to go after those who first falsely swear against you. Their basket shall not be full and their houses and their barns shall perish. And, you know, they're going to be cursed to the priesthood forever. And they're going to have swift judgment and, and all of these things. Maybe, maybe, I don't know how this is presenting itself to Joseph. We don't know Joseph's revelatory process. I know in my own life and my own experience that God has revealed things to me where I am at in my life that I've written down in my own journals that I've looked back later on in my life and realizing, you know what, that particular truth was not objective truth, but that is what I needed at the time to be able to make the next step. Mm Mm-hmm. It's like God couldn't get me from point A to point Z because I was not prepared for it. I wouldn't do it unless God gave me a little bit of time there, a little bit of grace. And so he's like, okay, I'm going to take care of that. And then to be able to move over into – now, I mean, and it is the same way as a parent. Like when my two kids are fighting and then one of them comes in and say, you know, is telling on the other one and I tell him I will take care of it, sometimes that's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I have to kind of spell out like how, how I, and I have to be careful with being honest here because it's, it's, this is what I'm thinking about doing. And sometimes I'll tell one kid is like, okay, I'm going to think about going and talking to, to the other kid who's, in, who's, you know, complicit in this argument about this, this, and this. And then with that, now that the other one knows the game plan, then I'll go in and I'll actually sit down and I'll talk with the other child and I'll get that side of the story. And then, and then we can work on reconciliation. But sometimes it's just not enough to say, listen, I'll take care of it. Right? There has to be almost like a game plan. Like, well, how are you going to take care of it? And it's like, <laughs> well, right? And so I see that a lot with Joseph here in his trauma. So as we go through these these chapters, or these, these sections rather, for me, just, just to reiterate, it's not necessarily that this is the necessary absolute will of God, but that this is what Joseph needs to hear in order to be able to get to the good stuff, as it were. And that good stuff is so, so we go through all this vengeful, spiteful, and all of a sudden there's this immediate transition. 
and we get into this this the doctrine of this priesthood. I'm like, where does where does this even come from? Yeah. Where do, where do, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about God, where are you? And God comes in, he's like, I'm gonna destroy all your enemies. And by the way, this whole beautiful th- passage about priesthood. And then we yeah. get back into the, you know, section 122 and about destruction again and 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 more trauma and more reconciliation until finally they're out of jail in 123. And then they're like, now we got to go through and document every bad thing that's happened to us and, and take them to court. And so you can see the stages of grief and of trauma that Joseph is going through in these sections and how God is healing Joseph through that process. Yeah, it's it's almost like you're seeing sort of the nuts and bolts of the repentance process here. There's definitely a pattern going on. It's something that I brought up when we did section 109, which was the dedicatory prayer for the temple because we saw these sort of ups and downs this roller coaster and there were these even contradictions from verse to verse that that he would talk about you know god needing to to do justice on their enemies and then like in just the next few verses he'd be like well you know forgive our enemies and you know and 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 we'll forgive them and then he would say something like you know Things have been done against us and we're innocent. And then the next few verses we say, well, we know we've sinned and, and, you know, and so <clears throat> there's a lot of this back and forth that goes on here. And I see that in this section too, with Joseph Smith earlier talking about how he'd been abandoned. And then he starts, the Lord gives his response and he says, well, you know, you're not, it's not as bad as Job. You're not as bad as you think, you know, he's kind of bringing them back from that. Um, so like I said, there's, there's a little bit of this this wrestle or struggle or dance going on in this prayer um, that moves Joseph forward so that he can he can sort of let go of all that stuff just like you were talking about. Um, I'm wondering if if um, this doesn't follow a bit of the pattern that we see in Moses and third Nephi nine through eleven, where we have these these awful things happening. People wondering where God is, right? They're they're crying, they're praying, they're wailing. We have this voice that comes that declares destruction, justice, and judgment. And then seemingly out of nowhere, there's light, right? And it's something totally different. It's something totally, it's just like pure truth, right? Christ comes down. And I'm not saying there's an exact parallel here, but but it, it seems to fit a, a pattern that I see sometimes in these these prayers and these revelatory processes that we go through. We, the, these struggles of letting things go, of overcoming our our ego, and learning to actually see God. That when we finally do third Nephi 11 experience of Christ coming down, this revelation on what the priesthood really is, when we have these moments of of light kind of bursting forth, right? It's just something totally different than what we were experiencing before. Um, These steps that he goes through to get to it, um, they're kind of also reminiscent to me of, of that process of justification where, you know, the Lord uh, justifies us in each step that we're taking back to him, even if that step in and of itself doesn't achieve like a celestial standard, right? But that process that we're going through in that direction is that is righteousness, right? It's the repenting process. That's the direction we're going toward a, a better understanding of who God is, who we are, and our relationship with him. Yeah. So we arrive at these verses here. I mean, I I don't want to skip over this transition verse because you had some interesting things to say uh, about this verse uh, 33, but I I do like the imagery brought up here. You know, how long can rolling waters remain impure? What power shall stay the heavens? So he's talking about revelation here and the sort of the, uh, the implication here is that our understanding of who God is and what reality is, is incomplete. It's like muddy water, right? And as the Lord gives us revelation, it's like water flowing through that. And if the more that the water is flowing, then the more that those impurities will, will sort of 
uh, clear themselves out over time or over the course of, of revelation. Maybe, you know, time isn't the right measurement for it. Um, and, you know, it, it uh, it's interesting because of what it just happens earlier in this section, right? And then what comes next, um, that the Lord is, is telling them that if they just continue line upon line, that eventually these, these things that they don't understand that seem unclear, um, don't seem to fit together. They will, they will become clearer as they continually seek more revelation from the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. This transition is so interesting in verse 33, because we have all of this, this dread, this wrathful, vengeful, spiteful God. And then we get into this, this, this little excerpt about the gift of the Holy Spirit and kind of the time and place and the bounds set and everything has its time. And then this, how long can rolling waters remain impure? What, what power shall stay the heavens? As well might man stretch forth his puny arm to stop the Missouri River in its decreed course or to turn it upstream as to hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge from heaven. Upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. And it's like, and then, and then we just have this new, <laughs> this new doctrine coming out about priesthood. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are so set so much upon the things of this world and they aspire to the honors of men, they do not learn this one lesson, that the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven and that the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. You know, so this is a, this is really interesting. You know, we're talking about the, we've already talked about the modality of priesthood before and about how we create these modalities, these stories that we live into and that we, and we, and we get into. And, and here we are starting to build the modality of what is this concept of priesthood. We've already seen the administration arm of it, right? We've already seen that it's the authority, this, this, this authority thing. And going way back to our conversation with Oliver Cowdery and John the Baptist in like section 13, right? And, and about how this went into, uh, the, that little excerpt at the end of the Pearl of Great Price. We had this kind of, this concept of priesthood of, as an authority initially, as an experience that they were brought into, that they could bring other people into this experience. And then from that moment, it, it quickly evolves into this legalistic authoritarian concept of priesthood, where it's the authority to be able to set the parameters and to be able to govern and to, and to regulate and to, and to set the terms for the ordinances and what, and what have you. But then section 121 is a different, is a different approach to priesthood than we've had before. Right. And, th and that's really why we're coming back here to 121 is because this is setting a completely different story. This is more than just an administrative arm, an administrative portion of it. This is section 121 for me has always been this concept where Sure, you can have the administration. Sure, you can have the rights. Sure, you can have that whole discussion. You can kind of have your cake and eat it too. You can have that on the side. You don't have to dismiss it. But here, here's the true essence of how to determine if this, if what you're acting in as priesthood is a true modality. And that's where we start getting into this whole, listen, you can, if you have any thought about doing anything for your own honor to be seen, that's not what this story is about. If you think that you can possibly go out and do it for your own emolument, for your own gratification, your own self, that's not it. It's not for your praise. It's not for, because there's a certain power that comes from that. You know, I, Ben, you, when, uh, we used to do a lot of, uh, political discussions and I was, I was starting to get into politics. I had a few really personal experiences. That really drove me out of politics. I didn't want to be there. I, did, I didn't want to be involved in politics with my raising my kids. I didn't want my kids to be around it because there's a spirit, there's a presence, there's a, there's a power that's there in the, in those political arenas. I didn't want my children to be around and I was very protective of them. And so I, I wanted to raise them until they were old enough. And then if they wanted to, I can, then I can bring them into that experience because this, to do things by the honors of many, that's where I look at almost this whole thing of what section 35 or section 120 and verse 35 is talking about, this honors of men. To be mm -hmm. seen of men, I mean, that's like politics 101, mm -hmm. right? 
And so if you want a juxtaposition between priesthood and this honors of men, I think politics is a really great example of the other side of that because that's all politics is. It's to get, I mean, it's, it's a dog and pony show. And you incorporate principles and goodness and all of the right virtues. And then, and then you, you do that to where you supersede and you do that over your competitor, right? And th- that's how you get elected. That's how politics works for better or worse. But the priesthood is not that thing. This is the opposite of that thing. This is that the rights of the priesthood can only be by the powers of heaven. And it's nothing, it's almost like when when this is coming out, it's like whatever you think this has ever been, it's not, it's different than what you think. So so that's, that's the vibe I get here. As soon as it transitions with verse 33, what I get from it is this vibe of God coming down and saying, hey, whatever you think priesthood is or was, or this kingdom of heaven thing is or was, it wasn't that thing. Let me get down to to a deeper level and see if we can help you with the principle and I'm like a meta story that's even deeper than that. Yeah, I, I, I like what you just said there, meta story, like meta story of the priesthood, you know. It's almost like this is the 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 metaphysics of priesthood. <laughs> right. <clears throat> <laughs> At the essence of it. Um the the administrative part and what we've been talking about with offices and so forth, that's like the shell so to speak. And and we're trying to get down to something more essential here. Um, you know, this is um, practically, it seems, uh, the same sort of discussion that Alma is having in with the people of Ammonihah in Alma chapter 13, um, where he goes on about high priests and, and talks about power. And because that's Ammonihah's whole thing, Right, the Ammonihaites are all concerned with political power or power per se, and they they are mocking Alma and Amulek that they don't have any power. You obviously don't have any power. You know, we're able to just put you in prison and hit you and smite you. We were able to burn all these women and children. You didn't have power to save them. What are you talking about? You don't have any power. And you know, Alma's whole thing is that's not power. Whatever you think that is. That's not it. I didn't come here with that kind of power. I came here with a different kind of power. And this is this is kind of what this 121 is, is getting into. Um, that the power of God is something different than the way that the world views power, these honors of men. And I like how 35 puts it because the the implication here is that the understanding of of this truth that priesthood can only be exercised by the principles of righteousness is something that you can't learn from a verse. Ironically enough, there's a verse there telling us that, right? But what it's saying is that if a person aspires to the honors of men and their heart is set up, set upon the things of this world, they cannot learn this lesson. It blinds them to understanding this the the epistemic ability right is is not there because the perception is in a totally different place so then we we move on to these things that in 37 sort of catalog why this is the case it's because the person is acting in what we would call the false self, right? And we get these things like covering your sins, gratifying your pride, vain ambition, and that's grouped in with exercising control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the children of men in any degree of unrighteousness. Well, what is a degree of unrighteousness? And we talked about, I've talked before about righteousness one way to look at righteousness is uh, repentance. You know, uh, righteousness is a a process by uh, or a state in which a person is repenting. So if a person is repenting, they're seeking to look to God and go in that direction and understand who he is. That's righteousness. That's a direction. Um, and unrighteousness is a direction that turns away from God, something that's turning away from the true self from Christ. 
and and turning us more towards that the our shadow or maybe the the satan archetype type thing right so that's the the degree of unrighteousness it's accusatory it covers sins it uh, gratifies pride like all these sort of things seeks to control or compel people and then we get this phrase here if all of these things happen amen to the priesthood or the authority of that man so we've also talked about authority in terms of um experience right um authentic so authority being what you've experienced and you can then bear testimony of that or or witness of that because that is your experience and when you're acting when a person is acting in the false self it's not a true experience right their true self isn't experiencing reality they're actually living in outside of or their perception is opposed to reality and so it's not a true experience so what does that mean amen to the authority of that person they're not going to gain the experience of god and reality while they're within that perception that state um, that direction of unrighteousness so to speak yeah, great stuff there. And and to add to that, you know, it's you you talked about, you know, to cover sins and gratify pride in our vain ambition, to exercise control and dominion and compulsion over the souls of the children of men in any degree of an unrighteousness. You know, these are the things that are the honors of men. See, once we feel that we have to cover our sins, why is that even a thing? Why do we have to cover our sins? Well, it's be, it's almost always entirely because of our fear of what the other is going to think about us. We cover it because it's our reputation. To gratify our pride, our pride is almost always in relationship to another person. You know, if we're the only person on an island, you know, it might be that we have a really, you know, we build ourselves a really big tree house out of palm trees, right? But what does that really mean? Are we going to be very prideful about it and controlling and possessive of it? If we're the only one on the island and we have no concept of anyone else, but it's the, it's in the immediate experience and the relationship of the other that brings us in where we begin to have this thing of gratifying our pride because it's always in competition with the other or to have vain ambitions and ambition for what? Because you're just, enhancing or, or being able to grow yourself to be in competition with yourself no this vain ambition is always almost always in relationship with others so all of these things that we're talking about are how we control the other's perception of us in us to be able to stay in the false self and control other people's opinions of us to keep their high honor to keep our position high and so this is when, you know, we see, you know, the mercy of God to be able to have, you know, the sins shouted from the rooftop. You know, this is a gospel of proxy. We have a whole temple ceremony set up for things by proxy. And so to be able to have by proxy these sins shouted from the rooftops, it's once this is, this trauma is spoken, it's no, it's no longer hidden. It's not a moment of shame. It's not a moment of condemnation. It's a moment of bringing out from the darkness the trauma that has been hidden because we have tried to satisfy our vain ambitions. It's God bringing us into the conversation of this priesthood narrative of being able to say, listen, you cannot have the experiences of what you can truly experience while you're having this trauma and hiding from it. Right? And in this, in this way, when we do this to ourselves, we are left to kick against the pricks. It says here in verse 38, behold, ere he is aware, he's left it unto himself to kick against the pricks and to persecute the saints and to fight against God. And isn't this interesting because this is exactly what Cain does. You know, we've talked a lot about the Cain narrative. He refuses to be able to speak his trauma. He, he, what, what does he do? He, he, cut, he sought to cover his sins, to gratify his pride, his own vain ambitions, and to exercise control and compulsion upon the souls of the children of men with his brother Abel. And in doing that, he would not confess and to speak his trauma, and God couldn't 
help him if he didn't speak his trauma. And what was his curse? He, he kicked against the pricks. And when Jesus comes to Saul, Paul, and he uses the same metaphor of kicking against the pricks, right? And so this becomes the, the same the same kind of verbiage, the same idea that gets repeated over and over and over again. We are our own greatest persecutor. And we do it because of our fear of how we are seen. You know, as a church culture, there's this, this problem we have that I've seen since I was a kid. I heard adults talking about it, but it's usually in like little passing. Nobody has a solution for it. But it's this idea of don't air your dirty laundry, right? We don't talk about our sins in the open mm -hmm. because that's just airing your dirty laundry. Don't talk about it in the open. We don't need that. We need to have faith-promoting stories and faith-promoting stories only. And so what that's done implicitly, that's created a culture where everyone goes to church with a mask on. You know, I saw this internet meme at one point and it just about floored me one time. And it was like, why are people so worried about wearing a mask in church? You've already been doing it for years. Ouch. <laughs> and so we go to church with masks on that we live our church life on Sunday and we come home and it's not the same thing. And we put on that face when we go to church because that's just what we do. Because there's no mechanism there that we've created for ourselves culturally to be able to heal each other. We go, we can listen to the lessons, we can go and we can be there with the sacrament, we can go with intentionality, we can go and have spiritual experiences. But where it actually comes to mourning with those that mourn, with comforting those who need comfort, and to standing as a witness of God in all times, things, and places, the standing as the Savior with the Calvary and the Gethsemane experience for the other, we haven't culturally learned how to do that yet. In other words, we haven't culturally learned how to live the priesthood yet. We have this thing that we think is the most great. Literally, this priesthood narrative that we have from, from the church is the single most unique thing that the church has. It's the thing that it comes back to every single time. Priesthood authority, priesthood authority, priesthood authority. And if it is as grandiose and unique as we think it is, we're not treating it as such. We're not living accordingly. You know, President, you know, there, there's that talk. I know, Ben, you and I have uh, talked about this before, but uh, Pre Elder McConkie has a talk that came from 82, 83 called the doctrine of the priesthood yeah, 82, and is 82 and and he uh you can go google it and i'm paraphrasing because i don't have it pulled up but he says something to the to the point of is like listen there's there's no, been very little talked about this it's not very much in scripture it's not very much given over the pulpit this is one of those things that christ reserves to teach himself he says it's unknown to the world and even very low, little known to the church the one thing that we think differentiates us more than anything else, true priesthood authority to be able to have these ordinances and everything. And all we do is we reduce this priesthood down to the ordinances that we perform. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. And I don't want to discount. I'm not discounting the importance and the beauty of the ordinances, but it's more than that. Just reading section 121, just from this, this small conversation we're having, it's already so much more than that. It's bringing out and allowing us to speak our traumas with each other to truly listen to. You know, my wife is really good at this. When, when she sits down and, and she's really, really good one-on-one -on -one with someone where she'll sit down and she's like, hey, how are you doing? And most people are like, I'm okay. And if she knows you're going through a hard time, she's like, uh -uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. And she'll be like, no, seriously, how are you? And whatever it is, my wife's got a gift where it's just it, people just open up. And it doesn't take much. But you got to get past that first or second layer. We're trained to be able to, like, how you doing? Good. Okay. Awesome. See you later. We're not trained to go deeper. Now, I get it. In the particular way that our wards function, we're kind of thrown together into this same group. We don't get to choose the group we're in. <laughs> you know, the, the only thing mm -hmm. we really get to choose the group we're in is the, is the house we choose to live in. You know, it's already in a geographic proximity. We're kind of messed up. And, it, and just, that's what it is, what it is. And so when you go to church, it's like, it's one of these things that that's just the community you've got to learn how to live in. And there's going to be personalities there that you don't jive with and that don't jive with you. And that's why we have lessons of being like, you know what, you've got to go there and make it your own experience. And, and we can have that conversation, but what it comes down to is, can we be the person 
who pushes past that first answer into something deeper. Because that's, if nothing else, that's that first step of getting past that barrier and into something new. You know, imagine if our classes, our quorums, you know, maybe if not at a congregational level, maybe at a a class quorum level, imagine if those were loving and authentic enough places for us to confess our sins to each other as the scriptures invite us to do. You know, there's multiple times where it talks about when we go to church and we gather that we confess our our sins to each other. And when's the last time you heard somebody do that? I mean, maybe you did. Maybe you heard somebody get up in testimony meeting and (laughs) go off on all their sins, right? (laughs) But everybody kind of like, looks around and they're uncomfortable super uncomfortable and if it goes too far the bishop's like hey you need to go sit down <laughs> right that's it, it, it we're not comfortable with that and, no. and you know maybe maybe that's not maybe you know a, a congregational you know sac or a testimony meeting isn't the right place for that but what i think is imagine if a a, on a on a smaller level, a more peer level, where there could be genuine um, interaction and discussion, you know, almost like therapy session, right? It, where that could happen. What if it were a safe place for that? Can can you imagine the power that could come from that? I don't know. Yeah. See, we're we're afraid of talking about sin because we don't want to target fixate on it. But that's because we're, we've constructed the culture in the particular way that when it's brought up, we don't know how to deal with it. Mm. You know, there, in, in priesthood, I, there's been at least three examples in my life. And, I, I, and I'm, I'm so sad that I have to say it's only three examples. Where there has been a man who's come into priesthood meeting who during opening exercises, you know, they'll, you know, da, 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 da. Does anybody have anything else to say? Right. And just one person will raise their hand and like, Guys, I'm going through a really, really hard part of my life. I would like some prayers. And those those moments stand out to me because I'm like I, because it was in those moments when your world stops and you realize, oh, something else needs to happen here. And I I felt so ill equipped to do anything to truly comfort. And to mourn with them. And I didn't do anything. I, I I prayed for him, which was what he asked. But I felt like there was so much more I could have done, but I was ill-equipped. I still don't I still don't know what to do <laughs> most of the time. That's just not the culture we have. And so whenever we we have these moments when people express their trauma in public, we want we want to usher it away into into, into hidden rooms with people who can talk about these things in, in, in the quiet solitude of homes. And there's a place for that. I'm not diminishing that at all. There is definitely a place for that moment too. We don't want to just have meetings where everybody just starts like going well, off. And all the- yeah. You wouldn't be required to, but imagine if it were a place where people felt they could. Yeah, right? exactly. It's, it's that moment, but the thing is, is we don't have a culture to even do that. We have a culture, we don't have a culture where we truly trust each other, where we come to those meetings and we feel like we even have a rapport most of the time with those next to us to be able to open up our lives and the things that we're struggling with. Half the time, we don't even know what we're struggling with ourselves. And it just becomes this ongoing thing where we just go for the two hours because that's what we're supposed to do. And we're told it's important, and we're told our salvation depends upon it, and we're told all of these things, but when we go, there's benefit there. But we're not getting the healing of the saints. And so in a lot of ways, I think I think what that does for me is it opens up the possibility of saying, you know what, if nobody else is doing it, then at least I can do it. I can be the one to be able to say, hey, I need help. Because there's been some very, very sacred times in my life where everyone wants to be on the end of the conversation where they're the one helping someone else. 
but the most sacred parts of my life where I was on the beneficial end of someone else's charity. Because that's the moment when you realize God's watching out for you. And so it's in those moments when can you place and put yourself in a vulnerable place for someone else to be able to reach out in potentiality and also keep grace because in recognizing that the culture is not equipped to be able to immediately answer those needs. Yeah. But at least be able to present it in a way to offer the opportunity to be able to normalize this. Got to start somewhere. And maybe we can start something in our own, in our own small areas, in our own small, and and maybe it doesn't even have to happen in church. Maybe it can truly happen whenever you have a, a ministering or a minister come, a minister come over who is talking. And when that minister comes over and when that minister comes over that you actually begin to express what you really need more than just. Because I, I mean, let's be honest, every single time a home teacher or a visiting teacher has ever come over to our house, we're good. <laughs> it's just, we're good. We don't need help. But what if we were like, you know what? Just pray for us. We're, we're, do, we're doing it. I can't see of any need we have, but please just keep us in your prayers. We need your strength. We need your thoughts. We need, we need, that would be beneficial. Yeah. We, we do need each other. And that is going to way that helps us to be able to connect that way. You know, that, that does uh, provide a, a pretty interesting context or way to frame the rest of these verses. Because as you're talking about that, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about those things that, you, that we've been talking about as I peruse these verses. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness, by love unfeigned by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile, reproving betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and then showing forth afterwards an increase of love toward him whom thou hast reproved, lest he esteem thee to be his enemy, that he may know that thy faithfulness is stronger than the cords of death. So there's some words that we don't use uh, a lot in here. Oh, one particular betimes out of verse 43, which means immediately um, or, or very soon, <laughs> right? Um, that we don't let... <clears throat> things fester, right? And with sharpness means that we only talk about the one particular thing that needs to be addressed, right? We don't expand this into a condemnation of a person, but that we with precision talk about the exact thing that needs addressed, and what and but all of this is has a condition to it and the condition is when moved upon by the holy ghost why because only then are you acting in all of the things that it talked about previously and then just to make sure that this person understands your intentions you show an increase of love even greater than before afterwards lest he esteem thee to be his enemy because the whole point is not about con- is not about an adversarial position. Um, I think that, it, like, maybe not just culturally, but just like natural manny, <laughs> this is is seems rather difficult to do, and it's probably just because of all of the the um, egoistic baggage that we carry around with us, right? That uh, if we could strip ourselves of that more, that this probably would seem a little easier. But I like how 44 puts it. 
that he may know that thy faithfulness is stronger than the cords of death. That he knows that your love for him is more important even than the little thing that you think is a problem that you brought up. And um, I've seen this done before, but I'd say it's pretty rare. <laughs> yeah, I've I've seen this attempted a thousand times, and I've seen it done correctly maybe twice. Yeah. And because usually we – Usually we have a fear. Usually we see see some kind of behavior that we we think is incorrect. Usually we have something that we 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 feel needs correction. Mm-hmm. And I've come to realize that whenever that kind of feeling is the the motivation for the reproof, it's the wrong motivation. Yeah. When I, 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 my own anecdotal experience. You know, the, the greatest reproof I've ever been given in my life, even now, and I've, I've shared this experience once or twice before, was when I was much younger, before I was married, and, and there were there was a series of, of bad choices I had made that had put me in front of a bishop's office, and, and so I came in, and I didn't even know what I was going to say, so I stood there in his, you know, sitting in a chair for like two minutes without saying anything, and I'm like, well, now he knows I'm going to have to, I'm here to say something, back. and so I'm like going through this conversation in my head, like, should I say something, should I not say something, but now it's been like two minutes, and and uh, anyway, so I took this really big, deep breath of air, right, and, and just everything was going to come out, and this bishop put his hand up to stop me. And he he smiled of all the th- experience of all the emotions I thought I would see him have. That was not the experience. That was not the emotion I was expecting. But he smiled and he said, Shiloh, before you go, you go on, you need to know two things. First off, you need to know how much I love you. And the second thing is, is you need to know how much more God loves you. And it's going to be okay. And I've shared that before because it was in that moment that was the first time in my life i truly tasted the fruit of the love of god i knew in that moment like i had never known in that never known in my entire life that god loved me it was not a it was not a mental exercise it was not a something that i rationalized it was not just a truth that i assumed and i believed in it was experienced to the to the center of the essence of everything that I am. And it was in that moment when I was completely disarmed. I was completely stripped away from any pretense, any defense, any walls were gone in that moment. It was simply a bishop's declaration of his love and of the love of God that completely dropped every defense in front of me. I have never been so severely rebuked as I was in that one declaration of love. Because it was after that, it was in the spirit of love and of God's love that everything just came out. And it was in that one speaking of trauma and that moment I was healed. Everything else just was just icing. And so... When we look to rep- reprove be times with sharpness, and, and I think sharpness here is not that it's it's harmful or it hurts. I think you said something about it, Ben, that it just gets to the point. Yeah. And the point here is, is that God loves you. God loves you. To everyone listening, God loves you. God has never not loved you. You have always been precious to God, and you are precious to God now. In every way that you can completely fathom just how much that preciousness and that love that God has for you has never changed, and it's eternal, and it will never change. 
And that's when I look at here as this increase of love. That's why it's, it's not necessarily because, because we look at it as though we've got to be hard. We got to show toughness. And then we come in and we give a hug afterwards to be able to kind of make sure that they're not going to be able to be. No, this is one of those moments when you bring love into the mix and love is the reproof. Love is all that can happen as love can grow. And it's in that moment when we realize we have no enemies. It's in that love that we realize there is no enemy. We are not even an enemy to ourself because we've taken all of that ego that you talked about, all of that ego, and we've put it to the side and we've just let God be God. And that's the thing is, is we don't let God be God. We keep our ego here in check because we are the one who wants to hide and cover our sins and to gratify our pride and our vain ambitions and exercise control about how we live our lives and about how the world sees us. That we don't believe, we truly don't believe in the love of God for us. And it sometimes takes that experience of being completely unworthy in our own eyes of God's love for us to experience that awe. For us to be able to see, oh, God loves me no matter where I'm at. And it's in that presentation and that experience of love that shatters the ego. That completely wipes clear and to end so that covering of our sins and the gratifying our pride and our vain ambitions, we just let it go. And that's when we realize we're not an enemy to ourself and there's no enemy around us. I think that's exactly where this next verse comes into play. Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith and let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. With feeling and experiencing that love, I like how it says it here, confidence wax strong in the presence of God, right? There's, there's not the fear or um, feeling of condemnation or unworthiness, any of that in the presence of God, right? Only a realization of our true value. And how God sees us. And the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven. I really like the symbolism here. I think it yeah, really too. captures it pretty well. Because so much about what we learn through the beatitude process that uh, that can be overlaid on this as well is ineffable, you know, inexplicable. And the experiences that we have that that sort of put it into context and and teach it to us, going back to that verse thirty five, how when we aspire to the honors of men and our hearts are set upon the things of the world, we can't learn this. But then he goes through all of this and explains this process and says, now your heart is there and prepared. And that knowledge, that doctrine of the priesthood, this priesthood that I've been talking about for these verses, comes to you. And you can't really tell exactly where it comes from. You just all of a sudden know it, right? <laughs> One minute or one moment, it's not there, and the next it is like a drop out of the air, right? Like this distilling of the of out of the air. And it can come from anywhere. Right? You can go in the world and you can see God everywhere. And that doctrine of the priesthood, that understanding of who you are and who God is in relationship with him can come from anywhere, can distill on your soul from as if it were the air around you, right? 
So I, I really like that symbolism there, and there's a lot of depth to it. Yeah. I've always loved that too, because it's not the deluge. It's not, it's not even rain. Now I, I love rain. I'm one of those people who I, I think I could live my whole life and just rain and be happy. Um, <laughs> <I'll> move <laughs> but, to Seattle. <laughs> yeah. Move to Seattle. Right. And, and I think I would be completely happy with that. But this, uh, in fact, even my, my phone, I have an app on my phone that has raindrops that are always on my phone. So I always have a little bit of it here living in the desert, but doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven. It just, it, it, it percolates. You don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going. You don't know how it got there. It might even be a little at a time, you know? Right. But all of a sudden you see the drops start beginning to form. You start beginning to see how this works. And the Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion and thy scepter, an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth. You know, <sighs> we've talked about this before, but just to reiterate, I've long since given up on the idea that we drive the Holy Ghost away. Yeah. I don't believe in that kind of pathetic God that is that kind of scared by my sin. I believe, though, that I can tune myself off to it, but that God still pours through the cracks. God is always pouring through the cracks of my of the shell of my ego. In fact, that's my contact to God is when he pours through the cracks of that ego and when he and he finds my true self and he awakens my true self to the to the reality of what I've always already been that I'm not the facade and the fiction that I've created that I am truly a beloved son of God I'm a child of God that God loves and that that holy ghost thy constant companion is that aware is that is that awakening awareness of that realization of what has always already been because then at that point that scepter of that righteousness and truth that directionality that you talked about then and then thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion without compulsory means and it shall flow into you forever now we've always used that compulsory means when we're talking about politics right to kind of juxtapose the the coercion and violence of, of the kingdoms of men versus the the non-compulsion of the priesthood but I look at the compulsory means here, even in it kind of in a different light with what we've been talking about, about ourselves. There's a lot of times I think we, when I, when I listen to the Sermon on the Mount, I'm always impressed by the presentness of the Sermon on the Mount and of how whenever I read through it and I give myself just the time and the presence and the, and, and the, and, and the moment to read through it without feeling anxious about going here or going there, but I can just sit with it. Those words almost call you into a state of presentness just to be there for the sake of being there with, with God, sitting with God. I call it sitting with God. You just go there and you sit down and God comes down and he sits down next to you. And you realize that God's always been sitting down next to you. But the thing is, is this compulsory means... You know, there's so many experiences that we have where we have expectations on ourselves, who we should be, where we should be in our lives, what status we should have obtained, what we should have been able to provide for our families, where we should have been able to do things. Uh, there's a thousand, a thousand expectations about how things should have been versus how they are. And all of these things create a life of compulsion. Things mm -hmm. that we're compelled to do because we feel the expectation to have done them. In my life, I've, I've experienced these in so many myriads of ways, in so many complex ways. I've had narratives and stories about my own self that I've, and, and just identifying them is hard enough, but just identifying them, identifying these things isn't sufficient. They still, they still persist. And it takes time to work through these narratives and these identities that we have about ourselves, but that's the very essence of repentance. To realize that these false ideas that we have of ourselves, we don't have to live in those. But the difficulty is that sometimes we don't have any other context but these things. And so it's like, how do I get rid of this, this idea of myself? Because these ideas of ourselves, they they stick to us as though they are compulsory upon us, that we cannot see themselves other than this way. Maybe trauma has been done against us. Maybe we are the victims of somebody else's trauma as well. 
Maybe we've made choices where we've inflicted ourselves with our own trauma. Trauma comes in many forms and in many ways. But we're not compelled to live in that trauma. But here's the, here's the thing. When we sometimes get stuck in our traumas, we feel guilty for being stuck in our traumas. Because being stuck in our trauma is a perception that we have. that The, the concept of being stuck is in itself an expectation that it should be otherwise. That we should have been able to get rid of this feeling a long time ago. We should have been able to get rid of this a long time ago. And so there's an expectation about who and what we are and where we should be. And God's even coming along and saying that idea of compulsion on you that you need to be anything else other than what you are right now, just even let that go. Just sit in a state of rest and let me heal you. Speak your trauma. Come to me with this trauma and let's sit together with this. Now, sometimes in my life, there have been really bad situations, and just sitting with God doesn't necessarily change the external world around me. But I can tell you that I can conquer and I can deal with anything in those moments of sitting down next to God and recognizing that God is there. And in those moments when I can't, I feel just like Joseph in the beginning, 121. Where are you, God? And that's, again, going back to what we said before. We all experience this. But again, this is the process by which we learn how to stand on our own two feet in the presence and recognizing that God is always already there, even when we don't recognize God is there. And that even if we are experiencing and and still experiencing traumas and things that have happened to us and things that maybe we've happened that we've created for ourselves. And God knows I've created so many problems for myself. It's not even funny. And I know we all, we all do, but it's sitting there and letting that go where we recognize that we don't have to, that the compulsory nature of the, ex, that the expectations cause on us that we could even let those go. You know, I, I really like how you framed that in terms of of how we so often um, use the principle of compulsion upon ourselves. And if we're to stop using it on others, we definitely got to start first with ourselves, right? I think that much of our lives are spent trying to craft a particular outcome, right? It needs to happen in this way and and end up this way and things need to look just like this because this is the image I have in my mind of them. You were talking about expectations. And in earlier sections, we I've brought up several times before the idea that I don't want I don't think the Lord holds us responsible for a particular outcome. Or he, let me put it a different way. I don't think that um, the Lord wants us to um, focus on a particular outcome, even. That what he invites us to do isn't to achieve that particular outcome. It's simply to labor with him, right? Or to walk his path, to walk his path. And the outcomes are taken care of by him, whatever they may be. I like the use of the term flow in this. Without compulsory means, it shall flow unto thee. So I look at this, you know, not us not being overly concerned or worried. Christ talks in the Sermon on the Mount about uh, take no thought for the morrow. We've talked about how that isn't doesn't mean not don't think about it. It means don't be overly anxious or or worried about this particular outcome, right, (laughs) of tomorrow. 
Um, and it, it's, we have this popular saying, you know, go with the flow, right? <laughs> and so it's interesting that, that that word is here, that without compulsory means, it shall flow unto thee forever. Um, that our future or these outcomes will flow unto us without compulsory means. That the Lord just wants us to walk with him, to be with him. We talked earlier about the the rolling waters remaining in pure as well, right? That that flow, that we we the journey, right? We talked about that being that journey rather than that destination that is really important and that that focus. So I really like how you framed the idea that we wouldn't um, use compulsory means on ourselves. Um, to expect certain things of ourselves that when they don't happen, we are either angry with ourselves or, or condemn ourselves or, um, have expectations about the way things quote unquote should be when the Lord is just standing there willing to show us that who we, who we really are already. Yeah. You know, I think this is a. I think this discussion of priesthood is one that we. I I would hope we can start having more and more often, <laughs> more and more often. Yeah. yeah, I value the lessons we have on on ordinations and and using using it for uh, ordinances, but when we really get down to recognizing, and, and this is where, as priesthood isn't has nothing to do with male or female right this essence of god is present in all of us correct and so that's where i see this becoming applicable in all of our lives because this priesthood for priests and priestesses is the same that, that as whenever we find ourselves doing this it's like god says that thing is priesthood you're right and and so and so i i see this in a in a completely different way. In moving on to section 122, it's it's almost like now with, with this discussion, Ben, looking at sections 122 and 123, it's almost like I don't even have anything else to say about them because <laughs> they're so trauma-ridden that now it's like you can, uh, you can obviously see Joseph's trauma. You can see everything that he's going through. In fact, 122, he just lists, he has like three or four verses where he just lists every possible bad thing that he could possibly think about happening, right? Yeah. So it's like these, these previous things were things that actually happened, right? And then like 122 starts getting into these things where he's like, he goes back to the Lord and he says, yeah, but okay. So all those past things, but what about all these things that might happen? <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do about those? Right? Right. Yeah. It's exactly. Like, and so he's like, it's very high, you know, hyperbole everywhere. And, and I love this in verse six where it says, if they tear thee away from the society of thy father and thy mother and thy brother and sisters, and do, if with the drawn sword, thine enemies tear thee from the bosom of thy wife, you know, the drawn sword and this, this idea going back to Peter defending Christ with the sword power, and yeah, power. That's the power of the earth. It's the power of man. It's the, it's the power exerted because that's really what the earth and, and the kingdoms of men have is power by violence. But the thing is, is that no violence can truly kill a converted heart, Right. Um, the power of God is different. The, the son of man came to earth and against even, especially today, but e even then with the Roman concept of God back then there, the Roman gods back then were these gods that you pray to so that you could live longer and have more wealth and power and prestige. And yet this Ju new Judaic desert prophet came along and somehow his followers are saying that no, his power comes because he died on a cross, which was the Roman form of the worst type of humiliating torture you could possibly afflict. It's the opposite of power. That means that's the extinction or the 
the the quelching of power. Exactly right. Right. It, it it's it's this idea that the Romans were <laughs> the Romans were saying, "Listen, we killed your god in the most humiliating way possible, and you and you follow that god." I right? say, "Yeah, that's why we win." <laughs> <laughs> Right. Because we have these stories, right, where Christians would have followed this nonviolent path. And one of the, the primary ways that the early Christians were differentiated, because the Christianity wasn't a thing. It was a thing that developed over, you know, over decades and decades and centuries. Right. But, you know, these were people who still considered themselves Jews. And, and so how do you distinguish between a follower of this Jesus, this Yeshua, how, how do you follow, distinguish yourself as a follower? And they would always know them because they were this nonviolent sect. So they got to know them by the beliefs that they had and the paths that they followed and the, and the creeds. They, so then in this particular way, nonviolence became like the biggest litmus test for finding out who these, these new Jews were, this new, this new sect of, you know, Judaism. So these early Christians would basically say, listen, um, if Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and this whole nonviolent thing is true, then we should be able to find the dirtiest, nastiest, violent rapscallion of them all and convert them. And like, and for them, that was the Roman soldier. And so there's stories of like Christian missionaries going in, just marching right into Roman garrisons and start preaching Christ. And there are ro- stories of Romans who just in that moment would throw down their spear and take off their headplate and their breastplate. And they would walk out, being converted in that very moment to the message. And obviously, you can't do that. Um, and then at that point, the you know the Roman commander would come on there like, "What are you doing?" And the Romans, the ex-Roman soldier at this point, he's been an ex-soldier for literally two minutes, and they'd say, "I, I can't fight anymore. I can't be this way anymore." And then I get back to your post, and it was almost like this bewitching aspect that Rome started to see, like, who are these people? Because these soldiers would rather suffer death than go back to pick up their sword. How do you control that? How do you control someone who is willing to never offend someone, but who is themselves willing to die? How do, how do you, how do you kill that idea? It's, it's that these people are, you're walking into death how do you how do you kill that idea? Not with a sword, right? And that's the only power that governments have. And that's the only the only power that men have ever had is the power of the sword, the gun, the power of violence. And yet Christ came as the lamb to be sacrificed in the most humiliating political way ever to give up his life to show that yeah, that's the way. So yeah, when you look at 122 and you see this whole, the, all of the analogies drawn, and then finally God comes down and says, listen, know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The son of man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? Now, Ben, you and I talked a little bit about this before we recorded. And mm-hmm. one of the things that's present to me, as I, as I said at the beginning, is that what was present for me is that these, a lot of these scriptures in 121 and 122 and 23, it's not to say that these are necessarily the objective ways upon which it is a universal truth. And this verse is one of them. To, to know thou, my son, that all these things will give thee experience and shall be for thy good. So here's the deal. I know a lot of people who have created a lot of unnecessary problems for themselves and, and more and heap trouble, trauma on themselves because they get stuck into a pattern that suffering is their their litmus test for God's grace or for their righteousness. Let's put it that way. Yeah. That so long as they're in a state of a perpetual state of suffering, a sacrifice, and always having to like you know dig themselves out, that shows that they're on the right path. Um, this concept that all these things will be for thy good is that it kind of creates sometimes in our culture this idea that God is the author of our suffering and or that God's God's leading us through the suffering so that because you know and that has never yielded very good fruit that I've ever seen it in my in my whole life that has never yielded very good fruit 
Now, I know some people who are motivated by this kind of speech, but more, but nine out of 10 times, this kind of way of speaking lands sideways. And so for me, I can see when I was reading through this time, it was just became aware that I wonder if this is God's way of talking to Joseph who needed to understand it in this way. Maybe this way of understanding the trauma and the stuff that we go through doesn't have to be seen in this lens. Maybe this is not an, an absolute objective universal lens to see trauma and the traumas that we experience just to say, hey, you know, all this crap that's going on in your life, it's going to be okay. And at the end, you're going to be like, that was good. You know, I'm glad I went through all that trauma, right? Or is this a way for for God to comfort Joseph, that this is the way Joseph needed to be dealt with? And that God can deal with us and our trauma differently. It's just a thought I had. Well, I, I definitely think there's different ways of looking at it. You know, as many ways of looking at it as there are human experiences. So this is going to be particular to Joseph. One of the ways that I think Joseph might be understanding this is that, it, because verse 8 for a long time didn't really make sense to me, but but kind of framing how it is that Joseph is approaching this, what he's experiencing in the moment, how he views Christ. Um, one of the possibilities here, the ways that he is seeing this is that something like, um, you know, Christ experienced um, worse things than you're experiencing now. And that's not to cheapen your experience. That's not the point of saying that. That's simply to say that um, God can take from any experience and bring good from it. Um, that's not to say that God creates the experiences, that he desires them, that he heaps them up upon us, that he orchestrates them in any way whatsoever. Um, I think reality is just reality. Life is life. Existence is existence. And God no more creates those experiences or those traumas um, than he does, you know, create something out of nothing. What I think is the, the key here, though, is understanding that when we walk the path of Christ, it's the path of of being able to forgive reality, understand it for what it is, and convert it to good. Convert the experience always to good. That isn't, uh, you know, that's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. It's kind of the point. It's what Christ is continually inviting us to do and what he constantly offers his healing power for us. Um, in, in behalf of those experiences. So what I think might be going on with Joseph here is that he's, he's seeing all these things and the Lord is kind of saying to him, you know, when, when Jesus or when, when the son of man, he says, when Christ went through all of these things, even he learned from them. God, the greatest of all, learned from these types of experiences. And if these types of experiences are something that can give God the, with the greatest intelligence, understanding and learning, then there's something that can give you understanding and learning as well. And I think that uh, at least in the moment for Joseph out of this, he understood that <clears throat> no, um, no experience that we go through is useless. Um, it's not necessarily, uh, I wouldn't call it necessary, right? Sometimes, like I said, it just reality is what it is. Life is what it is. Um, but in any given moment, the invitation that we have from Christ is to follow him and that the path of following Christ is one whereby these types of experiences that the trauma of these experiences can be healed 
I like that. And I think verse nine bears that out too, because, you know, it says, therefore, hold thy way and the priesthood shall remain with thee. Almost as if to say, hey, you know, this thing that we just talked about with priesthood that brought you comfort before that you're obviously now (laughs) getting anxious again about. (laughs) It's like, remember what I told you then that brought you comfort and spoke peace to you then? Yeah. Stay in that and remain, remain in that. That bound is set. That is a thing. You know, that modality, go, go relive and become comfortable with that new modality. Thy days are known and thy years shall not be numbered less. Obviously, I, you know, when Joseph said one of the keys to understanding scripture is he asked question, he says, what were they asking a question to that got God to say that? So obviously I, I'm thinking here that Joseph is very much wondering if his life is over, if he gets to see his family again, if he's going to be able to see the saints again. And God says, thy days are known and thy years shall not be numbered. And so it's just, or numbered less rather. And so it's just this recognition that God already knows. Don't be worried. It goes back to that Sermon on the Mount. Don't take thought for the morrow. The morrow will take care of thought for itself. Therefore, fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. It doesn't say, fear not what man can do. I'm going to stop man. It's fear not what man can do, but I'm going to be with you forever. Uh-huh. And so there's that companionship of God that you were talking about. I like that. Well, those those last couple phrases there, fear not what man can do for God shall be with you forever and ever. Just like you said, it has so much of the, the meaning here is that Christ is with him in this. The son of man hath descended below all these things. He's experienced all of these things. He will be with you through them. You will, you are not alone in this experience. And there's, there's, there's meaning to that. You know, even if we want to posit, well, there's not anything that I can possibly learn from this. Um, which I would be really surprised if, if somebody, you know, right in the middle of trauma thinks, you know, I'll bet I'm going to learn something really good from this. <laughs> like, I really don't think anybody thinks that in the moment. That's not natural. <laughs> right. Right. That's not normal to think that. It's only well after when we've healed that we can ever look back on something and and see uh, any good that came of it. Uh, um, but I... I think here what Christ is saying isn't necessarily, you know, shall be for thy good. You know, he says, shall be for thy good. But what he's he's saying also here in this moment is a point that we brought up multiple times. And it's it's a significant um, view, I think, or an important view on the significance of the atonement of Christ. And it's that we are not alone in anything that we experience. That Christ has experienced it all, the whole thing, and he is there with us. Fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. You know, going into section 123, I heard Patrick Mason one time, who's a Mormon study scholar, he teaches up at uh, Utah State. He said, Joseph may have at times done good or done well. I think he said done well. I think he speaks grammatically well. So Joseph may it, uh, may have done well to be able to reread some of his revelations from some of the actions that he that he went on. <laughs> and and section one twenty three I think is is one of those because here we have again I think is another evidence of Joseph's trauma and of God trying to come out to try to help this right. Um, because he's he's calling here upon the saints to be able to basically now waste and wear out their lives as an imperative duty that they owe to God, angels, and to them whom, whom they should be brought to stand in ourselves and to our wives and our children. This is very reminiscent of Captain Moroni in the title of Liberty. Yeah. Um, basically to go out and to, and to hunt out and to uncover all of the secret acts of darkness and to find out all of the, the problems and the traumas that have been happened to the saints. It, so, so this sounds like this is going more legalistic, right? So that they can be brought to a court of law and they can be able to get their uh, their land restored to them. Yeah, that, he seems to infer that that's the purpose of doing this. Yeah, right. But you know, one of the things I'm I'm I was thinking about when I was reading this is when all of the atrocities down in South Africa, you know, many years ago, went on. And, and apartheid was a thing and they were getting rid of that. And, and the minute they started to try to heal from that, the government did a really interesting thing in that they brought in 
all of the people who had experienced um, abuse from someone else and they wanted to record their story. Because what they didn't want to do is they didn't want to have 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the line having new stories keep on popping up. Mm -hmm. They wanted to finally have everything out in the open, record everything so that they just, just that whole speaking your trauma thing so they can move on. But then they did something really fascinating is that not only did they go to the people who were victims of violence, but they asked the perpetrators to come forward. And they said, even if you've perpetrated violence and have committed violence, we want your story as well. And we won't, won't prosecute you. We won't throw you in jail. We just need your story. Hmm. I, and when I remember reading that for the first time, yeah. I, was, I was floored by that kind of concept that it was to get the story out in the open so that both sides can heal. And so is God telling Joseph, if God's coming out and God's telling Joseph this, and in this language, and it seems very wrathful, vengeful, spiteful, is God moving something to where in uncovering the works of darkness that it's bringing out that story that needs to be told so that it doesn't have to keep on being festering and it doesn't have to keep on festering and being retold and retold and retold. And you know how te telephone, right? The game of telephone, how these, these stories begin to unfold. But once you document them and write them down, it's kind of cemented. You don't really change the story after that. And it kind of creates a stop to the snowballing effect of the trauma into future generations. The minute you bring these things out into open, you can heal from them. Right. And so in, in, in essence, I see a little bit, I think of that, what God is doing here in 123. What comes out on the page is we need to go after our enemies and we need to be able to make sure that we can punish them and come after them and, do all, and be able to get recompense and, and all the stuff that we've done and, and root this all out. Yeah. Prosecution. Prosecution, right? But what I see as a pattern that God has always been doing throughout time is rather let's just bring out the trauma into the open so that we can deal with it. It doesn't have to snowball and keep growing and then we can heal from it. I think there's a lot to that. This is a letter written by Joseph Smith to the saints, right? And what I'm curious about here is there, there does seem to be um, an implied revelation that evokes this letter, right? But we don't have that revelation. We don't have the revelation where the Lord tells him specifically do these things, right? And so I I can imagine, um, and it, it's not just imagine because this follows a pattern of of some other ways that things go, especially with Joseph Smith, that that there is a revelation that, that the Lord gives him about doing this, just like you were talking about. And there's a lot of inference that comes after that. Oh, the Lord wants us to do this. It must be for this, 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 and this purpose, right? And so a, a lot of times we put a little bit more baggage on that revelation <laughs> um, right. and we say, oh, this is what the Lord wants us to do. And then um, I can see Joseph Smith writing this letter and explaining it all to the saints, right? Um, and, and, and kind of adding, you know, how he feels about it in there, which, you know, is, is certainly his right and part of his responsibility. Um, but uh, I, I, I think you're on to something there when, when you talk about how uh, the bringing out of all of these, these acts, these traumas, these experiences and getting them out in the open is a step towards healing. I don't know that the prosecution through the state is a step towards healing. As it turns out, that didn't go anywhere anyway. <laughs> right. And, and I think that's an evidence <laughs> for it too, right? Because when yeah. you have these, 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 you know, you're right. It's not a revelation, but it's a letter that is coming as if from a revelation. And so yeah. the interpretation of the idea of God, you know, this, this, an imperative duty that we owe to God, right? You know, where's that coming yeah. from? Yeah. But then this doesn't ever go anywhere, right? right? This whole section doesn't actually, they, they never bring this to a, a fulfillment. And even if they tried to do it, <laughs> it, it, it didn't work. 
And then eighteen, you know, and then we we learn what uh, six years later Joseph is killed, and then another three years after that they move out to Utah, and so it just it, it never gets resolved. Well, can you imagine Joseph Smith writing a letter and is like, "Hey, everybody, write down your experiences so that you can process the trauma, and then just <laughs> burn whatever you wrote down, right?" Like that, <laughs> you know, nobody's going to do that, right? Right. But I can right. imagine, I can imagine the people seeing this letter and being like, "Okay," and. And everybody like doing this, like writing it all down. And the process of them doing that actually brings some healing. Maybe right. not completely, but like actually brings some healing. So like it encouraged them to actually do that and record that and, and process those things um, as a people. Whereas, again, if he just said, hey, you know, everybody just record this in your journal so that, you know, in a hundred years, people will be able to read it and. <laughs> you know, I, uh, he does, he does go on a little bit about this. You know, he says in verse 15, let no man count them as small things for there is much which lieth in futurity pertaining to the saints, which depends upon these things. You know, brethren, that a very large ship is benefited very much by a small helm, a very small helm in the time of a storm by being kept workways with the wind and the waves. Okay. So, there is a little bit of evidence here, I think, that, that he he might understand the purpose, even if he is still a little bit, you know, legalistic about it. That he's seeing that if if they're able to record this and, and process it, that it will allow them to heal and and keep the the ship pointed in the right direction, as it were, right? Therefore, dearly beloved brethren, let us cheerfully do all things that lie in our power. And then may we stand still with the utmost assurance to see the salvation of God and for his arm to be revealed. It almost comes full circle here. Um, it, it feels a little bit contradictory to the previous verses that seem to be wanting to appeal to government for a redress of their wrongs and saying that somehow doing this is going to, what does he say? Um, shall call him forth from his hiding place, right? He's talking about God here <laughs> because right. he, he feels like he's still hidden right but then later at this last he says you know what let us cheerfully do all things that lie in our power and then may we stand still whoa stand still you mean you're not gonna like still go after and prosecute these guys um with the utmost assurance to see the salvation of god and for his arm to be revealed and then we can just be sure that the lord's gonna take care of everything and we'll see his power we'll see his arm yeah and this is a fascinating pattern that keeps repeating we saw that in zion's camp right mm -hmm. yeah this this very militant we're gonna go out and do it we're gonna go out and fix this we're gonna go out and reclaim the land and they get down there and god's like N no and they're like oh okay and they turned around and they came back. <laughs> you know? These things happen all the time. That this this militant rhetoric that we're going to go out and we're going to do this, and and just the impassioned rhetoric, and, and like we talked about last week, Sidney Rigdon had two speeches that were very impassioned. That they were like, mm. "Yeah, this needs to be shared," and then they don't realize that the power of your rhetoric actually has consequences. And in Sidney Rigdon's case, it, it was really a catalyst that caused the saints' persecution. And so, in a lot of ways, we see this really impassioned rhetoric that I that I'm seeing here as them dealing with the traumas that they were dealing with, and and still trying to build this thing that they're this community they were trying to build. Because as we go into next week's discussion into 124, this is there's a huge empty space now of revelations. You know, we're going for a March of 1839. Till next week, we st we pick up in January of eighteen forty one. Once they're in Nauvoo, so so we're getting a dark spell here in the dark in the DNC as far as these revelations largely stop. So it, as soon as he comes out of out of Liberty Jail, and this is one of the things I don't know if we brought up at the beginning, but I, Liberty Jail really does change Joseph. And from everything that I've ever read about Joseph, this was a huge transition point in the history of the church because of everything that Joseph had to deal with in liberty that as the leader of the church and as and, and his whole way of doing things shifts here and so um the, the, and and not not to say that this doesn't actually affect the saints this also severely affects the saints right 
because they have their own experiences about building up Zion and building up the New Jerusalem and building up all this stuff down in in Missouri, and they're never going back. And so, but God commanded him to go down there. So now what do we do? And so now you got to, like we talked about last week with living on the land as for years, now we've got to go back up to Nauvoo and try to make a go out of it there. And then <laughs> it's, it's going to happen all over again. And they're going to head out to Utah. So it's just this, this repeating pattern of being displaced and always seeking to find holy ground in wherever you're going to, that I think is going to be a very prominent theme now as we've moved from Kirtland to Missouri and several places in Missouri and then out of Kirtland and then out of Missouri and into Nauvoo. And then we'll see when they move into Utah, it just this, this displacement of place followed by a call to be able to make the ground that you stand holy. Right. Well, do you have anything else to say about 123 before we close, Ben? Nope. I think I've, I think I've talked about it all too. So thank you everybody for listening. And um, we look forward to having you back next week when we get into 124. I have to see what we're, I think it's just 120, 124 is a very long section. So we're seeing, we'll see Probably what's there. Probably for just 124. So thank you everybody for listening until next week. I'm Shiloh Logan. I'm Ben Peterson. Thanks for listening.